Welcome back, USC Trojans on Fan Nation Podcast. I'm your host, Jacob Robom, and it's my co-host, Jacob Hare, as always. And the Trojans, just nothing, nothing, no way to put it, no good way to put it. Just an absolutely devastating, gut-wrenching, season-killing loss on Friday night in the Pac-12 championship to Utah. Second time falling to the Utes this season, and the loss took the Trojans out of the college football playoff, and now they're headed to the Cotton Bowl to face the two-lane green wave. But still, just just devastating, and it, it sucks because this was a team that early in the season when they lost to Utah, it felt like they were out of the playoff then. And now they had a real chance to get back there and then to see quarterback Caleb Williams get hurt and sort of the team fall down with that. It just it sucked to see. It sucked to watch. And now it's uh, off to the Cotton Bowl where – uh it's exciting in New Year's Six game, but still, uh, definitely, definitely not as meaningful as the college football playoff. Well, and it also sucks because after that loss to Utah, there were a lot of things that they needed to happen in terms of the college football race. And all of those things happened. Alabama lost, LSU lost, Tennessee lost. And then for the Trojans to be back in this position and be tied at halftime, 17-17 with the Utah Utes, I mean, you felt confident that they had a real shot at winning this game, and then it just all went sideways when Caleb Williams really got hurt and started playing through that hamstring injury. And it was more significant than viewers assumed when you saw him play on TV because after the game, Coach Lincoln Riley described it as a significant hamstring injury, which really surprised me because he was still playing well, but you obviously could tell he was walking with a limp. He wasn't playing like the full version of Caleb Williams that we've seen all season. So it's just really gut-wrenching. But for him to play through that injury and still try and lift his team up, that just speaks to his character as a leader. And Caleb Williams, even after the game, said that he, or not after the game, but later in the week, said that he was going to play in the Cotton Bowl. And he said it with confidence. That's the leadership type that I want for my quarterback. And I have a ton of respect for Caleb Williams for doing this. And this is the real reason why he should be the Heisman. I mean, obviously his play has been sensational all year, but he's really been able to lift his team on and off the field. And I can't say how proud I am of him and how much respect I have for him to really go off the field and make these comments and not be a guy who is going to sit out a bowl game because that's not something that I like. Those guys who go out, they lose and they're like, you know what? Off to the pros. I get Kale Williams as a year, but still the fact that he's still talking about a season that's dead and then he wants to play in this game for his teammates is something that I truly admire. Yeah, I mean, the, the game uh, Friday night tells you all you need to know about Caleb Williams' character and Caleb Williams as a player. He, he, he fights, he battles. I mean, obviously, we talked about the Coach Riley's calling it a significant hamstring injury. It tells you the type of pain he was in. They showed him limping off the field every time. And it just, it really, it, it sucks to see that a guy like that uh, gives everything he has to this game and comes up just short of... Uh, but what about a huge, huge accomplishment for USC in this program, making it to the college football playoff? And it's really unfortunate that you just have to imagine what what could have been had Caleb Williams not gotten injured during the game. And obviously, we're not going to make excuses or say, what if this, what if that? Because at the end of the day, they lost the game and now uh, they're not in the college football playoff. So nothing's going to change by making excuses or trying to say uh the loss uh, was only because of this and like we should still be there. It's just at the end of the day, they lost the game. and. It sucks, and it sucks that they uh, lost under the circumstances, but still uh, you have to clap it up for Caleb Williams and sort of how he just battled all night, being hurt, did it for his teammates. And the fact that now he's going to come out and say, I still want to play in this game. Like, obviously, it's the next year, so it's a little different. How do you, how do you uh, been going to the NFL after this season? I would say probably wouldn't see him out there, but him uh, stepping up and still deciding to play because he could easily sit out and say, I'm just going to get healthy and rest up for next year. But – He's not doing that. He wants to be there with his teammates. And uh, at the end of the day, it's still the Cotton Bowl. It's still a big game. It's uh, Winning is a big thing for the program. It uh, would give him a 12-win season, and there's no shame in going 12-2 and two at all. I mean, exactly. But I want to break down some of the comments that me and you made last week. And I kept note of what we said. Don't look at a score prediction from last week because that might just anger some fans. <laughs> but I mean, you were talking about last week, Jacob, that Lincoln Riley needed to get Austin Jones involved early on in the game, and he didn't. I mean, it's just straight out, he didn't. Austin Jones, 15 carries for 35 yards. 35 rushing yards. This is a guy who's coming off back-to-back 100 rushing yard games against UCLA and Notre Dame, and then all of a sudden he disappears against this Utah team. I mean, that's just unacceptable. 
and the fact that he was the only running back to receive a s- more than any carry in the game because Relique Brown and Darwin Barlow did not receive a single carry. I mean, this just furiates me that the fact that Lincoln Riley abandoned the run game and that when the passing game, I mean, obviously the passing game was there, but it really, 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 they never developed a rushing game, and that screwed them up later in the game because once they went into halftime with the 17-17 to lead, I didn't see a run game in the second half. I mean, it just completely disappeared. Mikhail was really the only one getting the bulk of the carries, and he was running with a hurt hammy. So I don't understand why Lincoln Riley wasn't taking the pressure off him and running the ball as he's three really good running backs on this roster. I mean, obviously it'd be different if Travis Dye was in this game because I think Coach Riley would feel more confident leaning on him in a game like this because Travis Dye has been there. He's seen it. He's played with Oregon. He's been in big Pac-12 games. So I feel that he has that boost going forward in these type of games. But obviously he wasn't there. And I also think the biggest thing for USC that really messed them up later in the game was when Brett Nealon got injured and just took him out of the game because honestly he's been their best offensive lineman this year him or Voorhees and the fact that they lost him was just huge and it sucks that his USC career is probably over as he posted on Instagram a little goodbye message assuming he probably won't play in the bowl game as he's out with an injury but I just don't get it furiates me that coach Riley didn't create a running game early on in the game and he completely abandoned it yeah, I mean, I completely agree. Would have liked to see more more running ball well and sort of establishing that it would have been helpful for the offense, especially with Williams' injury. But um, late in the second half, uh, you have to acknowledge that they were playing from behind eventually, and they had to start throwing the ball. They uh, once it got to like a ten point game, thirty four twenty four, it was really all passing. There wasn't uh, wasn't much running at all. They had to uh, try to score some points, which they of course didn't. But I think. Um, Certainly uh, couldn't couldn't agree with you more. It would have been good if they established the run earlier. It would have taken a lot of pressure off Caleb Williams. And, hey, but once again, not going to make excuses. Like, it happens. They uh, At the end of the day, they still didn't win the game. They can they, they, they can win games by passing the ball. They can win games by running the ball. So, you, you can say all we, we can say all we want about not running the ball, but they still they still had the opportunity to win the game. They could have they could have scored on some drives in the second half and they could have Easily, easily, they when you have a seventeen three lead, especially in a game like this, you're not expected to blow that lead, and they did. And it's uh, at the end of the day, it sucks, but that's that's the truth of the story. We can talk about all these things they didn't do right, but they had a huge lead and they gave it up, and everything's going to come back to the Caleb Williams injury. But still, they had the lead, they had their chances. They trailed by seven for even late into the second half. Not late, not I wouldn't say late into the second half. They trailed twenty twenty four seventeen. Uh, Late into the uh, third quarter, they trailed 24-17 at the start of the fourth, and they still uh, couldn't get it back. They had chances to tie the game, and um, hey, it is what it is. It sucks, and no college football playoff. But what what are you gonna do about it? And I want to I want to turn the attention to we talk about USC's running game, but Utah's running game. I mean, they they dominated on the ground. And through the air, it was uh, they had anything they wanted, forty-seven points, but they had two hundred and twenty-three rushing yards, including three rushing touchdowns as a team. Like it's uh, the running game was a problem on both sides for USC. Defensively, they couldn't stop Utah's run, and USC couldn't really run the ball as a team, and they never really got a chance to establish the run. And I mean, also you talk about defensively. This was the biggest side in the game that just was so eye-opening to me and blew me away. Utah had seven sacks, seven sacks, and USC only had one sack. OK, you're not going to win any games where your defense is getting one sack and the other defense is getting seven sacks. I mean, obviously, this was just a nightmare game for U- USC. Offensive line fell apart. Caleb Williams was hurt. He couldn't really do much at, from a mobility standpoint. So a lot of the sacks weren't really his fault, but he just couldn't get out of them because his offensive line crumbled. But at the end of the day, you're not going to I don't know how you expect to do anything. And. For the first couple weeks of the season, Jacob, we've talked about how turnovers were a calling card. Second half of the year, that completely just went away. I mean, in this game, Kyle Williams had two turnovers, which is his most turnovers in the game all season, which is actually just astounding to me that it happened at this stage of the game. But USC only was able to force one turnover when they got that fumble recovery by uh, when Jalen Dixon fumbled the ball and Brian Shaw had that nice little recovery. But look, USC didn't do anything that we've seen them do all season in this game. They didn't get Jordan Addison involved early on. I talked about the running game early on. I mean, Mario Williams had that nice touchdown catch, but I really would have liked to see more big plays out of him. And 
honestly, Jacob, Lake and Riley called a terrible game. I mean, just straight out facts. This was probably the worst game that he's called as the USC head coach. And at the end of the day, look, he had to make up for Caleb being hurt, but still, no running plays. He wasn't really getting any screen game going. And it just sucked that Lincoln Riley just went away from everything that we've seen him do this year and try to do be different in a game where you can't be different. This is a game where you have to stick to the winning formula the reason why you're in this game, the reason why you were 11 and one going into this game. And if I saw this box score and it's 47 to 24, the score, and I saw that Dalton Concade only had 40 receiving yards compared to last game where he had 236 receiving yards, I would have been like there. How did you? Totally yeah, I mean, I mean, we, we talked about it last week, how limiting Dalton Kincaid was going to be one of our keys to winning this game for USC. And I think, it really shows a lot about this defense, how they did that, but then Utah was able to turn to a variety of other receivers. They had three receivers over 50 yards, and hey, uh, they did They did one thing they were supposed to do, and then they sort of said, we'll just let the other receivers do what they want, and they'll spread the ball around, and three passing touchdowns for rising, and at the end of the day, um, they eliminated the tight end that uh, killed them last time, 16 catches in the first game at over 200 yards, but they still uh, couldn't limit the Utah offense as a whole. And, hey, a loss is a loss, and it sucks, but it is what it is. And, I mean, this was a post-game quote from Coach Riley that really stood out to me. He said, you come as far as this team and this program has come in the last 12 months. To get close to winning a championship and more, obviously not getting it done, it's a tough pill to swallow. That it, Coach Riley said this after the game, but you know what? This was a team that was 4-8 and eight last year. There's so much work that needs to be done. Look, folks, we're two years away from joining the Big Tw- the Big Ten. Excuse me. I'm feeling confident that in our first year in the Big Ten, we're going to have a much, much better roster than we have right now. I mean, Transfer Portal already has, what, a 1,000 players in it? I believe that there's two recruiting classes in college football now, and it's just been said over and over by many people in the college football industry. You got the high school recruiting class, and you got the Transfer Portal recruiting class. And honestly, Jacob... This is a bold take, but the transfer portal recruiting class is more important than the high school recruiting class at this point. I mean, oh, just I, I, with the NIL money coming in and everything, USC, you saw this year, they were able to get Addison his money. They're going to be able to do some special things in the portal. And I truly feel confident. Look, and the hey, Pac-12, hey, Pac 12 is going to be very relevant next year with Deion Sanders coming into the conference. And I feel that in the last year, people are going to realize that. If you're a freshman transferring after you didn't really get the playing time that you want or even a sophomore, and you could be able to play two years with USC, one in the Pac-12 where it's going to be a good conference next year, and one in the Big Ten, this is a place that I want to be as a player. Yeah, and I mean, you hit the nail on the head with the talk about the transfer portal. And I think the biggest thing for the transfer portal versus high school recruiting is, yeah, you could get some really, really talented players that are going to become NFL stars from high school and five-star recruits and all that. And I'm not saying that there's not – you can't find them in the transfer portal. But the thing with the transfer portal is you're getting players that have college football experience and players that are often ready to take a leap to a bigger or better program or players that played somewhere but know that they can go somewhere else and achieve more. You have players with the experience of playing college football players that, as opposed to high school who are just obviously have not played college football yet. So you get that part as well, which really can help your team, especially a team like USC that's ready to win now. And... A team like USC, sorry about that, that's ready to win now. And bringing in players that have that experience already, that benefits your team a lot. And I think, I think yes, they're going to have good high school recruiting classes as well, of course. But you, you hit the nail on the head with the transfer portal talk. I mean, obviously you talked about high school recruiting. It's hit or miss every single season. I mean, if just looking at the 2021 class, the top three recruits were Quinn Ewers, who had a solid year, but who knows if he's an NFL player. Corey Freeman for USC has absolutely done nothing for the Trojans, except that one interception against UCLA. They'll put him in the Hall of Fame of USC plays because just of the importance of that interception. And number three was JT Latham, who really hasn't done much for Alabama in his time there. It's so hit or miss, but in the portal, you know what you're going to get. We know what we're going to get with Jordan Addison. We know we got a Blaine Cough winner. We know we got Caleb Williams, a kid who was a f- true freshman dominating the Big 12 last year. So obviously you feel more comfortable getting guys in the transfer portal and you know what you're going to get. But on the flip side, there's also going to be guys that leave because we have some important news regarding USC players. Raylan Goforth, 
who had a big impact at USC during his four years here. And I want to give him a ton of credit for being a building block in this program. This is a guy who had 100 tackles. He's entering the transfer portal. And former four-star player Julian Simon, who entered his Trojan career with really high hopes. I mean, really high hopes. This was a guy who you thought was going to be a quality starter on defense for his four years here. He's entering the transfer portal. So you just never know. Those are going to be two guys that you're going to have to replace. You already have to get a completely new secondary in the transfer portal. You're going to have to get a completely new offensive line as you have Voorhees and Brett Nealon leaving. So there's so many pieces that need to come together for USC in the portal. But I feel confident that in year two, Riley's going to be able to do more. I've said it in so many podcasts. You're able to fix one side of the ball in the transfer portal. Offense, we're set. I mean, you have a true freshman next year coming in, Zakiya Branch, who's going to be probably the second maybe even first best wide receiver on the team, which sounds insane because he's the only true freshman. But him and Mario Williams are going to be a great duo next year. But this kid is really special. And then obviously Malachi Nelson, I expect him the red shirt, our star quarterback who's going to start in 2024. But you got to get more people in the transfer portal to come over if you want hopes at really, really competing for a college football playoff, which we did this year when we got Addison, we got Mario, we got Dai. There's just a lot of pieces to replace, but I'm confident that they can do it. And I've said it over and over again, but I just want to reiterate, Trojan fans, do not worry. There are some players leaving, but there's going to be a plethora of players to come in. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, You're right on with that. And I think um, we're going to have a lot of talk about the Cotton Bowl coming up in our uh, next few episodes. This one sort of, we spent a lot of time uh, debriefing the loss as there was a ton to talk about, a devastating loss again. And we're, uh, the season's not over yet. We still have one more football game to play and it's still a big game and look forward to that and we'll have more on it next week. But thank you guys for joining us and looking forward to talking uh, USC Tulane and the Cotton Bowl coming up next week. Fight on.